I show you those things just to just to get excited. You know, when 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 I'm here, it's just discipling. You know, but that's that's only you know a little bit of time on a Saturday. When I'm out of here, that's evangelism. Not because I'm a rabbi, because I'm a believer. And if I if I gave up this job, or if God told me to give up this job, I would never give up evangelizing. Never in a million years. You want to have a purpose-filled life? You want to feel like you're doing something? You want to feel like you're contributing? You want to feel like you're making God happy? You want to feel like there's a purpose for you to be alive? Share the gospel. Nothing like it. Um, okay, so Judah and Annie Bly did a great job reading. I was trying to explain to little Farah. I was whispering in her ear, do you know why mommy and daddy are crying? And she looked at me and I said, because they love God. That's why. Um, this is what we read from the Torah, Pasha. Genesis chapter 6. And uh, Genesis chapter 6, the chapter, is all about the time of this widespread sin, sadly enough. And of course, the global flood, which is really crucial. It says, here is the history of Noah. Noah, in his generation, Noah was a man righteous and wholehearted. Noah walked with God. Noah fathered three sons, Shem, and by the way, this isn't Ham, it's Ham, and Yephet. The earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth, and yes, it was corrupt. So sad. For all the living beings, can you imagine? All. The living beings had corrupted their ways on the earth. Um, let's just unpack it. Genesis 6, 9 through 10. Noah, just so you know, it's 10 generations from Adam. 10 generations down and Noah shows up. He was a righteous man, wholehearted, walked with God. He fathered three sons. These, these are the three major races. Shem is the father of all the Semitic people, all the Jewish people. We can trace Abraham back to Shem, a Semite. Jepheth fathered all the people to the north in Russia and west in Europe, the Caucasian folks. And then Ham was the Arabians, the Canaanites, and the Africans, major the black race, including the Egyptians. These are the three major groups of people in the world. It says he was righteous. That word is tzaddik. People in Judaism know when somebody says he's a tzaddik. That's, that's a special word. He's a special person. It means he's just and lawful. A tzaddik is somebody who's obedient to God's law, or at least they're trying real hard. It's very important to them to be obedient. He was wholehearted. Take a look. This is also a, a word that's very well known in Judaism. When somebody says tomin, it means he's complete, an integrous person, a, an honest person, somebody you could trust. Somebody who doesn't need an attorney when they sign a contract. They shake their hand, it's as good as done. They're totally in accord with God's truth. And then it says that Noah walked with God. Halach. It means to go, but it's used here figuratively. It means to have intimacy. It's, it's when you have a close and familiar and loving relationship with another. That's intimacy. And we're supposed to have that with God. And a lot of religious folks, to be perfectly honest with you, don't have any intimacy with God at all. Amen. A lot of people who know the Bible don't have an intimate relationship with God. They fall under the guise of knowing the word of the Lord, but not knowing the Lord of the word. Amen. They spend very little time with God. They think just reading the Bible is spending time with God, not necessarily. Amen. And then the sad part, verses 11 and 12. It says the earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth, and yes, it was corrupt, for all living beings had corrupted their ways. So we look up those words in red. The word corrupt is shochach. It means to go to ruin and to totally turn from what is right. We have a conscience. Now, what happens to sinners who keep sinning and sinning and sinning is their conscience is seared. I can tell you, the first time I did drugs, I don't know, maybe I was like 11 or 12, First time I tried, I knew it was absolutely wrong to do it. Everything in me knew it was wrong. Now, thankfully, I never became a drug addict. I don't know how, 
maybe by the grace of God, I partied on the weekends. My friends became addicted. Most of them aren't here today because they overdosed. But for some reason, I was able to pick it up on Friday night and let it go Sunday morning. But I knew, I don't know if you can relate to this, if you ever did something, maybe the first time you had sex, you knew it was wrong. Everything in you, but then what did you do? You felt guilty, so how do you alleviate your guilt? You keep doing it and doing it, too, and it's so your conscience is seared. And then you realize, not so bad, I'm not hurting anybody. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Is anybody human in here? Or am I talking to a bunch of religious people who want to put on their church face and make believe that everything is okay, even though nothing's okay? So this is, this is what happens. It's, the world at that time became perverted. Everybody was perverted. Now, people say, oh, it's so bad today. It was bad back then. Amen. It's a lot better in a lot of ways today than it was in Noah's day. Because in Noah's days, everybody, except for Noah and his family, eight people. How many people, demographers say, I don't know, maybe 15 million? Eight out of 15 million. Now we have almost 8 billion people. But the world is perverse. It's getting more and more perverse, right? More and more perverted. More and more wicked. More and more unnatural. There's just things that are totally unnatural. And it's illogical. And it's unscientific and not factual. Doesn't matter how you feel. Doesn't matter your feelings doesn't count. Facts count. Look at the word violence, Hamas, I'm sure you're familiar with that word, Hamas, Hamas, cruel and unjust. It means when people are Hamas, they're abusive, and they actually enjoy inflicting pain on others. They like watching them cry. They like upsetting people. Can you imagine how sadistic that is? This is a... This is a a really ungodly society. It's getting worse and worse, and I think it's going to get to the point where it was like Noah's day at some point. We're not there yet. But this is so disturbing to me. Look at Genesis 6, 5 through 6. I don't know how you can read this as a, a God-fearer and not feel terrible. It says, Adonai saw that the people on earth were very wicked, that all the imaginings of their hearts, imagine all their thoughts all their heartfelt thoughts were evil only. What? I don't know. I regret it. Can you imagine? He wished he never made us. It grieved him. I mean, he made us, he gave us a beautiful world, right? Five days, he made this world gorgeous. I've traveled all over the world. There's some incredible things to see. And he made people to love one another and support one another and be there for each other. Not to keep taking and competing and grabbing and wanting more and more and more. This was his idea behind it. And it went totally sideways. We even good people now just look out for themselves. And they spend their money on me, myself, and I. Good people. Look at Genesis 7, 19 through 20. It says, the water overpowered the earth mightily. Massive. All the high mountains under the sky were covered. Everest is the highest mountain, 29,632 feet. The water covered the mountains by more than two, 22 and a half feet. People say, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. Sometimes it rains three days straight and there's floods. What don't you believe about that? It's very believable. Scientifically, it's very believable. So here the Bible declares that there was a global flood. A lot of naysayers say it was a local flood. That's what they say. They don't believe that Everest was covered. It was just a local flood in that locale, in Noah's locale. How do we know that it's a global flood versus a local flood? Well, first of all, if it was a local flood, why didn't God just move Noah and his family to a different locale? Why'd they have to build an ark? 
Every now and then logic works, even when it comes to God, guys. Two, if it was a local flood, why would God instruct Noah to build an ark equivalent to one and a half football lengths, 150 yards, and the, the mass, the area, the volume, you could put 800 railroad cars inside the ark based on the biblical narrative. Three, God promised that the water would never again destroy all flesh, correct? There have been many floods since, tsunamis. Thousands of people have died in floods all over the world. But there hasn't been a global flood since. If the flood was local, then God would have broken his promise. And that is not possible. The flood recorded in Genesis 6 cannot be proved with absolute certainty. But the average believer can't even prove it a little. It's not good enough for you to say, well, it, the Bible says it, so I believe it. Good for you. But the Bible also says, set apart Messiah as Lord in your heart, always prepared to give a defense for the hope that's in you. Did you, did you read that part? Apologetics isn't just for a couple of guys who go to seminary. You've got to be able to defend your faith a little bit. Just a little bit. We make fun of the Jehovah Witnesses. They defend their faith better than we defend ours. You're laughing at them. They're laughing at us. But there's evidence, man, to support that a global flood did happen. I can't sit here with you until Yeshua comes back and go over it. But I can go over a couple of things. And it's important because it's going to tie into our New Testament portion you're going to see. There's an important message here. Really, really important. One... What about the physical evidence found on the Earth's surface? 75% of the Earth's land surface is comprised of what's called sedimentary rock. Sediment. Sediment, rock that was washed away, dissolved in some kind of fluid, and then redeposited elsewhere. Fossils are found in all these sedimentary layers. It's common to find massive, we found massive fossil graveyards consisting of jumbled, smashed, and contorted fossil remains that can only be explained by a large number of animals being destroyed simultaneously by an incredible force. Maybe a flood? As opposed to what? To what about the long-distant movements of various types of rock. For example, scientists have uncovered quartzites discovered 300 miles from their source in Oregon. A phenomenon no longer taking place today. The displaced minerals could be the result of water standing above the mountains and violently running down into valleys. Maybe. There's no other explanation. They have no explanation for it. With all their intelligence, they can't dance around it. And last but not least, what about the presence of abundant fossil remains of marine life on top of every major mountain range in the world, including the Himalayas? They can't provide an adequate theory. They're not as smart as you think they are. They dance around it. Fossilized marine life on top of Everest. I've seen flying fish in Barbados. They can't fly 29,000 feet in the air. What could have caused the phenomena? Maybe a global flood so cataclysmic and so powerful that the water did, in fact, cover the tallest mountains. Look at the New Testament reading. It's all about the rise of scoffers. Scoffers is a word that's only used in religious circles. A lot of people use it in non-religious circles. It's not meant. You could say a mocker, but a scoffer is only in religious circles. Look at 2 Peter 3, 3 through 7. First, understand this. Understand this, that during the last days, so he's talking 2,000 years ago about the last days. So we're further along in the process, right? Yes. Okay. Scoffers will come following their own desires and asking, where is this promise coming of his? For all fathers have died and everything goes on just like it has since the beginning of creation. But wanting so much to be right, you know those folks? Oh, yeah. They'll do whatever they can just to be right. Don't you just love them? They'll look at the sky and they'll go, it's nighttime. And they'll find a way to try to prove it. They got to be right. 
right? Don't be that believer. But wanting so much to be right about it, they overlooked the fact that it was by God's word that long ago there were heavens and there was land which arose out of the water and existed between the waters, between the sky and the waters on the ground. And that by means of these very things, the world at that time was flooded with water and destroyed. This is huge. Guys, the flood is so huge that we overlook it. We, we teach a little in little, you know, little, a little kid schools. The little cute ark and the little cute Noah story. It's huge. It's foundational. So foundational. It is by that same word that the present heavens and the earth have been preserved, are being kept for fire until the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. Let's unpack this. Second Peter 3, 3 through 4. In the last days, scoffers will come. So Peter's saying that we're going to know we're in the last days because there's going to be a rise, an increase over the centuries of scoffers. Peter, in his letter, is encouraging believers, read the Bible. Stick with the Word of God. Stick with the Word of God. He's saying the Bible is the only safeguard. That's his overall message against these scoffers going to rise. These are people who reject the knowledge of God and indulge in their own appetites. They advocate permissiveness. Whatever floats your boat. Whatever floats your boat. I don't know. Maybe the dang flood floated the boat. And they have a total disregard for impending judgment. They laugh when you talk about God's judgment. They scoff at you. They mock you. They have made you scoff. Guys, you keep talking about judgment. And everything, where, where's the judgment? God has never judged the earth. And then some people go, well, he judged Israel. Okay, so he judged the Jews. What does that got to do with me? He's never judged the earth. That's what they say. Our fathers, us, our kids. You keep saying judgment's coming, judgment's coming, judgment's coming. You've been saying it for 2,000 years. You've been saying it longer than that. Judgment's coming, judgment's coming. God's going to come and punish the wicked and destroy the earth. It's all a pack of nonsense, man. Stop running that line. They're basically saying there's no evidence that God ever intervened in history. So why would he? Why should we believe it? There's only one problem. They're denying the flood. When God did, in fact, judge the earth. Look at the next couple of verses, 5 and 6. Wanting so much to be right, they overlooked the fact that it was by God's word that long ago there were heavens and there was land. Guys, they deliberately ignore the flood. Deliberately ignore the flood. If it happened once, it could happen again. If the flood didn't happen, then they're right. God has never judged. But if he judged once, then he could judge twice. The scoffers are willfully ignorant about it. They pride themselves on being so knowledgeable. They profess to be objective in their reasoning. They pride themselves to adhere to principles of scientific investigation. But the truth is they ignore the flood. It's an attested fact. All you need to do is take a course in geology. Yeah. I've met geologists that can prove that there was a flood absolutely positively. You're not a geologist, you're not an apologist, you're not a scientist. They cat's out of the bag. From its inception, the earth was stored with means of its own destruction. I wonder who did that. It had water in its subterranean. You're not talking about a little rain. You're not talking about a sun shower. There's, there's water all in the subterranean depths. Those cisterns broke open. The water's in the seas. The water's in the clouds. 40 days, 40 nights. You're going to get a global flood, man. 2 Peter 3, 7. It is by the same word that the present heavens and the earth have been preserved are being kept for fire. Guys, global warming is a bunch of crap. But I'll tell you, when God judges the earth again, that's going to be global warming. When God created the earth, he seeded it sufficient water to destroy it. 
it, it says that when Yeshua steps on the Mount of Olives, which is just east of the King's Gate, and he walks through the Kidron Valley, it's going to split. We've read that for years. Scientists have uncovered a fault line. In our day, they've uncovered a fault line exactly where it's going to split. Who could have put the fault line there? It wasn't God's fault. He did it on purpose. It's science. It's no more. You don't have to be like, oh, well, it's written by men. Stop it. Stop it. Where are you getting your theology from? Veggie tales? It's the same manner that God put enough water to destroy the earth. You know what? He seeded the heavens and the earth with enough fire to destroy it as well. We're living in a nuclear age. We understand that matter is stored up energy. The splitting of an atomic nucleus results in a fiery release of enormous quantities of energy. So all the matter in the world represents tremendous explosive potential. If it happened once, you think if I didn't know this and believe this, you think I would still evangelize? What do you think I'm doing it for? My health? My well-being? Nobody pays me to do it. I'm doing it because I'm desperately concerned for people's souls, even if they're not concerned about their own. Sorry, I forgot my water. This coincides with what Yeshua taught when they asked him about the end of the age. He didn't say, it's not for you to know. Mind your own business. Focus on what's important. That was in Acts when they were trying to figure out the exact day and the hour. But when they asked him about the last days and when are these things going to happen, he, he gave 97 sentences, guys. That's a buttload of info. All of chapter 24 and chapter 25 is an answer to their questions. And we have access to that. Repeat it again in Luke 21. Look at what he says in just a couple of verses. For the Son of Man's coming, meaning his second coming, will be just as it was in the days of Noah. Man, he pulls right on Noah. Boom, he pulls it right in. Back then, before the flood, people went on eating and drinking, taking wives. You can go on and on, going to movies, going on vacations. Right up until the day Noah entered the ark, and they didn't know what was happening. They were clueless until the flood came and swept them away. It will be just like that when the Son of Man comes. What is, what is Yeshua emphasizing? I think he's emphasizing the fact that people in the last days will be oblivious that it's the last days. Yes. Why are you amazed that they're oblivious when it was prophesied that they'd be oblivious? <laughs> the routines of life went on as usual. People focused, even Christians, even Messianic Jews, believers, focusing on all the minutiae, all the dumb things. Getting kids extra lessons in baseball. They're never going to make it in the big leagues. You could tell a kid when they're five if he's going to have any kind of potential. Oh, if they miss a practice, they're going to be no good anymore. They're no good now. I'm just saying... Let the kids play sports. Let them have some fun. It's a game. Knock yourself. What are you screaming about, nut job? You're yelling at him because he called your kid out at first, but you won't share the gospel with him. What's wrong with this picture? What happened to us? What the heck happened? They were warned about the flood, but they lived like they were going to be flood-proof. When the flood came, they were unprepared, just like the masses are today. Many today are unprepared. Why? Because they're caught in a trap. The Lord showed me this acronym long time ago I, I noticed on many websites it's been hijacked 
And um, I don't care if they give me credit or not. I don't care. Let it be hijacked. All copyright is your right to copy. Send it out. Just don't say you came up with it. That's dirty pool. The acronym is Tolerance, Relativism, Apathy, and Political Correctness. Hear me, because there's many believers that are falling into this trap. If you're going to be a people pleaser, you cannot be a believer. It doesn't mean that you've got to be mean. If you're not underwriting in love, you're not a believer either. But Luke 6.26 says, woe to you when everybody likes you. Does everybody like you, ma'am? You don't have to try to get people not to like you. That's mean-spirited. But by the same token, the world and the spirit in the world hates the spirit in you. You're at war. Stop trying to get them to love you. If you want to get people to love you, become a politician. Let me tell you about this thing. Look at tolerance. This, I'm giving you very simple definitions. Permissiveness, that's what tolerance is. And it's amazing how the most, the people that are crying out tolerance the most are totally intolerant towards us. Amen. Isn't that a kick in the pants? Permissiveness. I'm just going to give you Yeshua's response to these four items, what he said, because what he says matters. What I say doesn't. Let me tell you what he said about being open-minded. Look at Matthew 7, 13, 14. Yeshua said, going through the narrow gate. When they call you narrow, that's a compliment. Amen. For the gate that leads to destruction is very wide. It's open-minded. It's permissive. Yes. Anything goes. The wide gate is where everybody's going. You'll just get pulled there if you're not careful. You just find yourself. Yeah, but I'm a believer. Then why are you going through the wide gate? The road's broad. It's easy to walk on a broad road. Many travel it. But it's the narrow gate and the hard road. Stop trying to find the easy way out. Amen. Stop trying to make it easy for yourself. I just want it to be easy, Rabbi. I just want it to be easy. Life has become so difficult. Life has become so difficult because you made it complicated. The faith isn't. Amen. The faith is beautiful. The faith is amazing. Stop going after things that don't matter. You're wasting so much time and energy. It doesn't matter. What is it going to give you? You've got 6,000 square feet now. You want eight? Do you really think that's going to make you happy? If Yeshua doesn't do it for you, nothing will do it for you. It will never be enough. Amen. Go the hard road. That leads to life. And just a few find it. Yes. Eight got on the ark. Eight. Noah, Mrs. Noah, Shem, Ham, Jepheth, and their three wives. Eight. If you think the numbers are out there today are accurate, you know how they base those numbers on? Church attendance. You could sit in church all day long and not become born again. I'll prove it to you. Go home, sit in your garage for two hours, and see if you become a car. <laughs> What's popular is not going to be right today. And what's right is not going to be popular. Until recently, the state in America smiled on the family. It was the basic unit. There's an old saying, as the church goes, so goes the family. That's a lie from the pit of hell. As the family goes, so goes the church. It's the family that's the backbone of our society. They encourage, on TV, the government encouraged people to attend church and synagogue. How's that going? The government is using judges, educational institutions, and especially the media to misrepresent, ridicule, and even defame Bible believers. 
We're not in a post-Christian society. We're anti-Christian, man. Wake up and smell the coffee. Our faith is a counterculture. It was a counterculture in the first century. It's a counterculture now, and I like it. I like being part of a counterculture. Next part of the acronym was relativism. This is the theory that morals and truths are not absolute. What, what? I don't know. What do you identify as? I identify as a believer. You want to identify as a woman? You want to identify as a, an animal? What, what, it's okay. That's your truth. You're entitled to your truth, and I'm entitled to my truth. Why does your truth have to be my truth? There is no absolute truth. Well, Yeshua says that's absolutely not true. John 17, 17, he says, God, Father, set them apart. Now, I'm not talking about Amish and the Mennonites, okay? I'm not talking about them. They're isolated. God is close to isolate ourselves. The church is in the world as it should be. The world is in the church as it shouldn't. So these groups, they isolate and they hide. How are you going to shine your light when you're hiding your light under a bushel basket? They hide their kids. They hide everything. That's isolation. But the other extreme is absorption. Let the kids have a little taste of the world. What's the big deal? No, there's a happy medium. He that's in you, be in the world. Be in the world. Go after the world. But don't be of the world. Yeshua says, Father, set them apart. Let them be sanctified for holy living. Let them show the world what they're missing out on. The joys of godliness. It shouldn't be drudgery to you. You're being protected. You're being prospered. You're being blessed. You're being watched over. You're being loved. What's bad about that? He says, set them apart by what? Truth. Your word. The Bible is absolutely the truth. And the truth is that Yeshua is the only way to the Father. Period. End of story. This is one of my personal favorites. The A, apathy. It's a lack of passion, emotion, or excitement. People are passionate about everything except God. I'm talking to believers. I'm talking to you, sir. Sports, passionate. Money, passionate. Politics, passionate. Yeshua, he's all right. That's our new trinity. Money, politics, and sports. That's what people talk about. You know, it's that whatever. Whatever. I'd like to whatever slap you. (laughs) Whatever. Nothing matters exactly. Useless for the kingdom. Whatever. Look at what Yeshua said. Not to non-believers, but to a church about their attitude about whatever. Revelation 3, 15 through 16, he's speaking to a church. These are not non-believers. And he says to these believers, I know what you're doing. You're not cold, and you're not hot. They say it's bad to be obsessive. Who says that? Psychologists? Where do you see God saying it's bad to be obsessive? Do you think God's ever going to sit one of you and go, you know, you took me a little too seriously. You should have lightened up. You seem to be a little obsessive about me. Were the disciples obsessive? Today they would be thought of. They were nominal. When you're obsessive, you're nominal. Oh, I wish, Yeshua says, oh, how I wish you were one or the other. If you were cold, then you'd be so far gone that I can maybe heat you up. If you're hot, I can use you. But because you're like just tepid, you know, like that lukewarm bath that you love to sit in for hours, you're not cold or hot, so you know what? You make me throw up.
They were indifferent. They were always fluctuating. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to read my Bible for two days. I'm going to spend time with God this weekend. Last but not least, political correctness, the ideology or behavior is to minimize offense. Guys, believers, come on, man. Black people, white people, Jews, Gentiles, Spanish, Irish, you all have idiosyncrasies. You all ha- you're stereotypical. That's the way it is. You have a culture. I've been all over the world. Wake up. And the cultures are funny. Laugh at each other's culture. It's a lot of fun, remember? So offended, so weak. I'm, I'm hurt. Why do you think all the comedians were Jews? And they made fun of themselves. Because they had to find some laughter to survive the Holocaust. You've got to find some laughter. Stop being so uptight. Don't buy into this ideology. I, I just don't want to hurt anybody. So I'm going to edit my whole life. Let's see what Yeshua had to say about political correctness. You hypocrites! Uh (laughs) Isaiah was right about you when he prophesied about you, children of God. These people, try that today. These people, they honor me with their lips. They could talk up a storm about me. People talk today. They talk and talk and talk. But their hearts, their worship of me is useless. Keep studying. Keep studying. Go ahead. They teach man-made rules as if they were doctrine. They take these things that they made up themselves and make them precepts, biblical precepts. Yeshua hated that. Hated that. You want to wear a kippah? Knock yourself out. What does a kippah mean? It recognizes a person as a traditional Jew. You are not... Well, the high priest, he wore a mitre. A kip is not a mitre, and you're not a high priest. Stop. Stop. People could tell if you're a believer by the way you conduct yourself. And I don't mean don't touch, don't eat. I mean by the way you love and care for others and reach out to others. Your level of compassion and kindness, the willingness to share the gospel to save a soul, even to be ridiculed. And if that's not enough for you, if, if calling a bunch of believers hypocritical is not unpolitically correct for you, because I know that in Matthew 15, I know what was going on. You see, his disciples, they weren't as strong as he was. And they still had pharisaical friends and, and non-believing friends following other rabbis. And they had to live with these people. You know, if I go to a church and blow it up, i leave. See ya. I love guest speaking. It's like being a grandpa, right? Give them candy and coffee and ice cream and throw them back to the parents. But the disciples came to Yeshua and said, Listen, um, you're offending them. You're seriously offending them. And Yeshua says, You listen. Wait till I get to Matthew 23. (laughs) Look at what he says to them. You snakes! Your fathers were snakes! But this is serious. How are you going to escape being condemned to Gehenom? The Valley of Hinnom where they burn the garbage 24-7. Another word for hell outside the kingdom. How are you going to? Scathing words from incarnate love. Harsh words from the Jesus we have today who sits at Starbucks 
and gets a macchiato and listens to Chris Tomlin songs and says, everything's going to be just fine. But you know what? Love is holy and love is righteous and love is just and love has to speak truth. And there's things I say, I know, right out of the Bible that you guys get offended. And you know what your problem is? Your problem is you, not the words. Your soul is offended and your soul's telling your body we need to change, but your body's saying, shut up, soul. Shut up. We're almost at the end. Genesis 7, 16. Those that entered went in. Those. Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives. Male and female. The animals, the clean ones. Seven kinds of clean. I mean, don't you even realize that Noah kind of knew what was right and wrong even before the law was given? How did Noah know what was right and wrong? It was on his conscience. How do we know what's right and wrong? How does a little kid, when they do the wrong thing, feel so terrible about it? It's put in them. The conscience is put in them. So he took one set of unclean animals and one set of clean animals. Noah didn't eat unclean. If he ate one of the pigs, there'd be no pigs today. There was only two of them. Back in the day, there was no, there was no plumbing. When I go to Southeast India and I see a pig herder, you know what the pigs do? Everybody defecates in the street. The pig is the only animal that he get at defecation all day long and survive. It was the what, crustaceans. Shrimp and mussels and clams. They're, they're, God invented them, created them, so they filter the sea. If they weren't there, you wouldn't be able to eat fish. And you know what clams and crustaceans eat all day long? I'm just telling you science. They, 100% of their diet is fish crap, pellets. So eat up. Gives a whole new definition to the saying you're full of crap, right? Maybe you just need too much shellfish. The ark was there to save Noah's family. But look at this. This is very important. People think that Noah went in the boat and he closed the door. Noah didn't close the door. God did. The lock was on the outside. That's why Noah couldn't open the door. That's why when they were banging at the door, as the waters, they said, please, Noah, let us come in. He goes, I'd like to, but I can't. If I could open this door, I would definitely open this door. 800 railroad cars of volume. I could let thousands of you on. Revelation 3, 7, God closes doors that no man can open and opens doors that no man can close. I don't know, shut him in. This is a beautiful picture. A beautiful picture. The ark is a picture of Messiah. Yeshua is our ark. The waters depict God's judgment. And it was at Golgotha, the cross, that Yeshua went under the waters undrown in God's divine wrath for you and for me and for the rest of the world. Did God judge the earth? Yes. Is he coming back to judge the earth again? Yes. Last but not least, this is the last of our scriptures, Genesis 9, 11 through 16. This is what God says. I will establish my covenant. I'll make an alliance for defense. A Brit with you that never again he's saying no i want you to know never again will all living beings be destroyed by the waters of a flood there will never again be a flood to destroy the earth and god ad- added and i quote here is the sign of the covenant i'm making between myself and you yes. and every living creature with you for all generations to come i am putting my rainbow in the cloud It will be there as a sign of the covenant between myself and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow is seen in the cloud, I'll remember my covenant, which is between myself and you and every living creature. Of course, God didn't need a rainbow to go, oh yeah, that's right, I can't flood the earth again. It was a sign for us, not him. And you and every living creature of any kind in the water will never again become a flood to destroy all living beings. The rainbow will be in the cloud so that when I look at it, I'll remember the everlasting covenant. Everlasting between God, me, and every living creature. Keep this right where it is. So I'm sitting on the beach, and I'm texting my niece because I know she's coming. 
And I know people throw this around like, you're here by the providential sovereignty of God. Not always. Not always. But sometimes a person is. Yes. Sometimes they'll hear a message and they feel like God is speaking to them and there's nobody else there. Yes. I knew that my niece was supposed to be here. Now she could have come any week. They decided to come today. We read a Torah Pasha and I knew she needed to be here. I'm sitting on the beach and I'm telling her about the flood. And I'm saying it's so important to be able to prove the flood because it proves that God did in fact judge the earth. I wish he'd judge that person right now. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the beach and I'm texting my niece, I'm telling her about the flood, I'm telling her about the rainbow and God's judgment. And then all of a sudden, it's raining out in the ocean. And if you know anything about a rainbow, I've only seen maybe seven, eight of them in my life. A rainbow can only occur when the sun is behind you, when it's raining out in front of you, and the sun has to be lower than 42 degrees in order for the light to pass through the water droplets to create a prism effect. All of a sudden, this is what I see. Show that picture. I literally see her, but I'm watching it rise. I'm just sitting and looking, and it's rising right in front of my face. And it's rising, it continues, and then it goes to the other side. You got that one? And I'm bawling because I'm telling her about the rainbow that God made a covenant, and it's a sign that I did, in fact, flood the earth, and the next time I'm going to destroy it with fire. And I'm thinking, man. And he's like, tell them, Greg. Now I'm telling you to tell others. I know it's kind of tough. But some of you are salesmen. You have no problem selling your face off to make a buck. What are you waiting for? If you knew you had a week to live, what would you tell people? If you knew God's fire was coming next week, what, what would you tell people? Would you tell them about the latest Netflix series? Your days are numbered, 15.9 years. Your days are numbered. It's the brevity of life. Make the most of it. You have opportunity after opportunity. We wrote the book. I'm begging you to get it out there. I'm tired of it. Here's the bottom line. Those who are in Yeshua are saved. And those who are outside of Yeshua are doomed. There's no other choice. It's one or the other. The prophets of old said, in the end, we will either drink from the cup of God's judgment or drink from the cup of God's salvation. We will either hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter the joy of your rest, or we'll hear, flee from me, I never knew you. We will either die in our sins or we'll die in the Lord. God has extended his invitation to every single solitary human being. It is a universal gospel for all. But how will they know unless we tell them? Rabbi, I'm not good at it. Start doing it. You see how good you'll get at it. God can anoint your efforts if you don't try. If you have never repented of your sins and you're here today, Rabbi, not this again. Yes, this again. Yes, this again. And again, yeah. and again, yeah. and again, yeah. and again, yeah. and again. Yeah. Yes. And you've never been immersed in Yeshua's sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins. Get your ticket, man, and get on the ark. Because when God shuts the door, it's too dang late. Let's stand together.
I think Bernadette is speaking at the women's conference. She does not speak in public. She does not like it. I can't believe she agreed to it. I know she was kind of like a little upset, she felt a little pressure, and it's not hostile at all. I just want you to know if she does well, I, I totally helped. If she doesn't do well, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the principle of peace, Yeshua. I love you guys. Shabbat shalom.